How are you, sir? Fine, thank you. Great. We're so excited. Jim Greenleaf, and we're at the Mojave Airport, better known as the Spaceport, yeah. um, where uh, things happen uh, on a huge level that affect the entire planet. And as, as you know, we spent time at DSN and uh, concerned about international cooperation. Mm. How are you addressing that issue in, uh, with what you're doing? International cooperation. Well, let's see, this last year I made four trips to Europe. Since I've been here, I've been to China, Europe, Central America, Canada, Alaska, uh, been to the Arctic and Sweden three times, been to Italy, France, Spain, Switzerland, the UK, going to the Netherlands uh, next month, uh, all with contracts with countries and uh, organizations that have contracts here at Mojave Airport. We are clearly in the international aerospace business. Which is really important for the future yeah. of this whole industry. Yeah. Glad the vision you have is amazing. I grew up in Palmdale. Mm -hmm. So above me in Palmdale was the right stuff. I mean, every day the contrails, the, the sonic booms, you know, you take it for granted growing up in it. Uh, but you see what's developed and what has come of this. And of course, coming past here, first began with all the planes and, and everything else you're doing. Uh, it, it's just an amazing contribution, not only to the community, but to our world. I mean, that's the way you can look at this. Can I ask you when this vision began for you? Well, I. I've said many times, I don't know if I've ever had many original ideas, but I'm very good at hearing one or recognizing one when I see it or hear it, and then acting on it and building on upon a good idea. And I, I think that's who I am. I, uh, my predecessor, Dan Sabovich, had a, a brilliant idea to create a civilian flight test center at an old abandoned marine base. Uh, all we've done is uh, you know, inject that idea with steroids and take some of the ideas from my tenants and create a framework which allowed them to be successful. And the successes of some of these key firms at Mojave have attracted others like-minded in their industry and it has the Silicon Valley effect. Uh, many people have said, well, these people compete. And I say, you know, it's a funny thing HP competed with Oracle and, and Dell and, and uh, I don't know, Sybase and, and uh, the others uh, right there in the, in, in the uh, Silicon Valley. And they got along just fine. They all shared a workforce. And, and you start thinking about that. The same thing's alive and well here in Mojave. You have uh, rail, soft tire, air, and now space. And we've just added the internet a pipe and the, the highest throughput available in the United States added data. So now we have the five dimensions required for our industry to grow exponentially uh, going forward. Mm. Badre Yunus, who runs uh, the Deep Space Network out of Goldstone, um, uh, says says that that that's just, that's it. That, that's an amazing um, amazing feat that that we're able to bring together. And, and they say that NASA and you two now are really dream creators uh, to, to 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 live the dream. And the important thing is the next generation. You talk about thirty somethings out here. Well, you, you, we want to get primed up with these ten year olds, eleven year olds, and get them involved. And I see that happening a lot. Uh, um, so in the future, uh, let, let's say twenty years from now, how do you see the Mojave Airport? Mm -hmm or Spaceport. Is that the new name? Are we going to call it that from now on? We're known as the Mojave Air and Spaceport. Okay, yeah. good. Mojave Air and Spaceport. Thank you. Uh, 20 years from now, well, it, it's frankly not that hard for me to see it. I uh, Hopefully you'll see suborbital activity point to point within the United States or maybe even some cooperative foreign partners operating from certain locations in the United States. We are a natural for that activity. Uh, I think these activities are highly compatible with our military neighbors in a non-encroaching way. We've proven it. Uh, that is a very big deal. I think some of these systems being developed for the private sector have a natural military application. Those are being studied now. Those will be in operation within 10 to 15, 20 years. 
the aerospace market uh, is clearly shown a trajectory away from manned operation to unmanned or optionally piloted vehicles. That business was started here in 1953. This was the Navy's Center of Excellence for Unmanned Air Systems in 1953. Mm. We've had continuous operation of unmanned air systems in Mojave since. We currently have five different tenants that are engaged in that business. Uh, even though I'm a pilot and I, it's what I do, it's what I've trained to do my professional life, it's what I identify with, but frankly, machines can do the job better than humans in many regards, and in many cases safer, because if you look at the preponderance of mishaps, pilot error. So it's, it's almost gotten to a point of how safe do we want to create our industry. It's now an industry that is so safe. If you were going to take a flight today, you don't even think twice about it because five million people in the United States will climb on an airliner today <laughs> and all arrive safely at their destination. That's unthinkable, but we created that. It is so safe that if you were born in an airliner today and lived your entire life in that airliner, the chances of you living to a ripe old age are greater than if you were born in your own home and lived your entire life in your own home. Wow. That's what we've created. It would be nice to think that if we could take the lessons learned from endo-atmospheric routine flight and take that to space, because the only metric we have on safety in space is NASA's, and NASA's and the Russians, uh, they, they have the ability to, to uh, put safely into space uh, something on the order of 96 and a half out of 100 people safely. Now, we have got to do much better than that in the commercial sector if we're going to have a successful man-rated commercial space industry where humans routinely go to space. It is still a very hostile environment. I want to go. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it, we're working on the, the methods and the technologies and the fuels and the propellant systems in Mojave and other places to achieve an exponential uh, improvement in safety over what's currently recognized by government operations. I have enormous hope and admiration for Elon Musk and Gwen Shotwell at SpaceX and what they've been able to achieve with a very small team. You know, a team of a couple thousand employees, they just took cargo to the station and back. And they're going to go again soon. And it's now the second successful mission. It's pretty impressive. It really is. And now you've got NASA as a partner at Dryden working with us on the Flight Opportunities Program. Uh, you've got NASA up for a reauthorization bill this year. Uh, NASA has just, uh, and the federal government has just uh, commissioned a, a new study on what to do with NASA over the next half century. These are great conversations to be having. And in each one of these conversations, it involves the integration with the commercial world. That is what excites me, is that now we now have our oar in, and boat in their pond. And it's, I think what we're finding is it's not necessarily competitive with the government, it's very complementary with the government. And it's exciting, it's, it, it, it's re-energizing the next generation, and uh, I think that's what gets us all up in the morning is we now have the interest of the next generation. Exactly. We're um, locally here uh, with the FAA Regional and NASA. Um, two guys, um, uh, they, they formed a corporation called uh, Clancy JG International, mm -hmm. Don Rea and, and John Clancy, and they're one of my clients, and they are so excited about what you're talking about and about the unmanned and the drones and, and everything that we can do to, to bring it over from, from military to use in, in, in the civil world. And, and it's amazing to see the leaps and bounds that you guys are doing. And talking to, to, to Badre out, out there at, uh, at, at Goldstone and Mr. McBride uh, out there at NASA, you guys are all on the same page. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Yeah, David and I did a speaking gig together in the Arctic in Sweden last November, a year ago. Traveled together and 
and uh, it was really a, it was a great time. I remember standing out and watching the midday sun, which was about that high above the horizon for a few minutes before it disappeared for the rest of the day. And uh, uh, we had a great trip at the Physics Institute in uh, Karuna, Sweden. And we've, we stay in very close contact. In fact, we have a project we're working on right now, uh, which will be a 2013 project, which is, is exactly what we be, need to be doing to motivate and improve the skills of each of our staffs and uh, continue building this framework for tomorrow. Badre says that by the year uh, 2015, as we land probes, as we go out in space, we'll have internet. And you'll see with a GoPro that, that, that land on Mars. Uh, uh, and, and so internet's going out there. It's taking a couple of years to do it. But they say when that happens, it's going to bring so many more people into the world because of how important the internet is to us and social networking. Are you guys actively involved in social networking? Uh, you know what? I have found too many ways to communicate. <laughs> <laughs> you all say the same thing. It's amazing. It's, you know, uh, you know uh, those are still tools for me. They don't run my life. Right. They are tools for me to run my life. And I refuse to let information run my life. I still view it as a tool. Well, Armour Hammer said, it's not what I do, it's who I hired to do it. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you're hiring all the right people. Mm -hmm. But I got one question. I'm sure this is, a lot of people have this on their mind. Um, how did you get Richard Branson's eyes? I didn't. Uh, Bert did. And Bert brought him in here several times. Uh, uh, and uh, maybe we all did in a way, but I think I think Richard, Sir Richard, really uh, recognized what I talked about earlier about here's a man of incredible means, uh, locking arms with an incredible mind, and joining two visions and acting on that, seizing the moment. Then they did a location. All I did was uh, put on my catcher's glove and and recognize a fastball was coming my way and I better catch it and uh, create an environment with, that was attractive to them. And this R&D environment we have in the Aerospace Valley is very attractive. And again, it's the, the permission piece. Uh, we gave them permission to build, test, innovate in Mojave. And I make no guarantees with any of my tenants that they will be successful. I give them permission to succeed or fail. And that's a powerful statement. It really is. Bucket list, you yeah. want to get out in space. Do you see yourself doing that with Richard on the same plane? Uh, do I? No, I doubt if I'll be invited <laughs> to be on that trip. But, uh, you know, many of my friends, my uh, roommate on the J USS John F. Kennedy uh, was Mr. Pierre Thewitt, and Pierre made three trips on the shuttle. And I remember the first day we met was uh, somewhere in the Caribbean, and he caught up with the ship. And I remember he tossed a sea bag in our room and said, "Hi, I'm Pierre Thewitt. Uh, I introduced myself." And he'd probably been traveling for 48 hours. He's pretty wired up, and we were getting ready to go ashore to go get a beer in whatever town or port we were in. And he said, no, I got to work on my calculus. I'm taking a master's course at SC on, uh, and I've got to get some work done. Uh, and he says, I'm going to go to space. And I said, well, suit yourself. We're going to go get a few beers. And I tell everybody, you know, as it turns out, I got a couple beers and he went three trips to space. <laughs> and uh, it's something I've always wanted to do. Uh, it, timing is everything in that business. You know, when you look at the uh, you know, I, I equate everything to baseball in my life, but you know, when you, most kids growing up, they all think they can be a pro baseball player, and then they realize one day that the if you took at the field of applicants for, let's say, first base on a pro team, you're talking of literally thousands and thousands and thousands of dreamers that want a, that spot. And there's only one spot, and the chances of working for NASA were greater odds than playing first base. Wow. So I came to the realization that you had to be incredibly smart, incredibly skilled, and incredibly lucky to be considered. And I'm 
I have many friends that have been, I want to go and see the view. Uh, I want to look out a window and dream a bit. I, that's something I always enjoyed about flying high performance airplanes was you can actually get high enough to where you don't see borders. You know, those are human, those are man-made. Most things which are, are, which create our limits are man-made. It's very interesting to put yourself out where you don't see the man-made limits and you begin to realize all those things you thought were limits, they were of some other human's creation. Uh, you can do anything you want to do. And I think that's, that, that drives me to want to see the view. Great. That's amazing. Stuart, you're an amazing individual, and we're so lucky to have you here where you're at in Mojave, in Animal Valley. Um, thank you very much for letting us in today and giving us some insights, and we're going to keep an eye on you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.